Matthew Perry, friends, lovers, and the big, terrible thing. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking a look from two alcoholics and addicts looking at Matthew Perry's book about addiction. Now, this book has been getting all kinds of press recently. Lots of people are reading it. There's tons of interviews. It's basically out there everywhere. So today, what Terry and I are going to do is look at this book with a fine tooth comb from an addict's perspective and look at what we notice. Now, there's some things that we noticed here that were a little bit off-putting. Some things were actually pretty good. I got my highlights here of some of the pages that we, that we went through and some things that I think were kind of damaging. So this is an interesting one. This is going to be an interesting talk. If you read the book, let us know by typing red book or something like that in the box. And uh, we're going to go through this with a fine tooth comb. We're going to look at exactly what happened. Um, Terry brought this idea to me last night at like, I think it was, what, 10 o'clock my time. Um, and I was like, okay, where can I get a copy of this book? And I had to get it on the Kindle, which uh, you can see is the screenshots here. Uh, but I was able to read it and listen to the audiobook both last night. And I think there's some interesting things. Um, and I, I, we want to go through that because a lot of times when you see someone in the limelight talking about addiction, I think sometimes it can do more harm than good. And I don't know about this case. This is an interesting one. So we're going to unpack this on this call and talk about what's going on. Is this more than just some dude with a couple hundred million bucks getting sober and talking about his times being a drunk? Or is this something more? Is this something that can actually help the fellow alcoholic and addict? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So Terry, how are you doing? And uh, let me get your audio going here. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's uh. It's the first below freezing day of the year. We're going to look at some snow. <laughs> but anyways, life's good. It's great being sober. The book was uh, interesting. It was not a bad read. Um, you know, he had some some good insights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I usually I try to look at the positive side of things. I don't think I try not to look at the fact that maybe he's just trying to make more money or something. That's just kind of how I try to look at things, and and um, you know we're going to go over some of that stuff and and see if maybe maybe this book can help you. We'll see. Absolutely, and I think it's very interesting because I I got into the book. We were watching a movie. We went out to dinner last night. I started reading it on my computer, which was a pain. I don't like reading on my computer, but mm. uh, I had to because I couldn't get a book at that hour. And so I, I was going through, and the first bit kind of hooked me in. It, it led me in. I was like, okay, this guy. He's got something to say. And I'll, I'll remember on page two, he said, by this point, I knew more about drug addiction and alcoholism than any of the other coaches and most of the doctors I encountered in these facilities. Unfortunately, such self-knowledge avails you nothing. And I think this is important because this is where I was, right? I was yeah. in my life. I was, you know, compared to him, I was a little bit successful, right? He was at the pinnacle of it. Um, and even with him, there's people with a million times more money than that. Um, I was moderately successful. I like to study. I like to read. I was intellectual. I got the idea of AA pretty much off the bat. And I read psychology books. I, I've been in, in and out of therapy my entire life. And nothing worked. I couldn't get sober to save my life, literally. And I, I realized that, yeah, that is true. Self-knowledge doesn't do anything. What you learn in this training, what you learn in the big book, what you learn in therapy and everything like that gives you options, but what you do keeps you sober. And that's going to be a theme we're going to talk about that I think is important that unfortunately I think is a little bit missing from this book. Um, if it is a book, because what I've gathered is that uh, Matthew Perry is out there talking about his memoirs and his drug addiction and his alcoholism. And the idea of the book was to bring awareness to it from what I gather from all the talk shows I saw him on um, and all the things. And so we want to look at that with a fine tooth comb and say, okay, is this bringing awareness and is it pointing at the right things that are going to help us get and stay sober? Um, and I think that's important. So Terry, how are you, on this topic of like, hey, I knew how to get sober. I just didn't do it. 
Yeah, I knew what I had to do, and I just didn't do it. I didn't want to. I didn't take those actions that I needed to take until I finally, you know, when I finally did take those actions, I was able to get sober. And when I didn't continue to take those actions and do things towards sobriety, I didn't stay sober. I, I started drinking again. Um, now, he was he was more than just alcohol. A lot of other things were involved. But uh, for me, um, I was pretty much just alcohol. But I would definitely say I, I can't do anything that's mind altering. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, but uh, his mo- most of his book is really um, kind of uh, what we call a drunkalogue, you know, and um, that was just kind of the, the war stories. Mm-hmm. And I've, uh, you know, being being in sobriety for some years now, I've heard thousands of these stories and his stories, you know, they're they're different per se, as far as they involve a lot more money because he had unlimited funds and things like that. But the stories are really the same. They're the same as far as far as of what I've heard people say. The feelings are the same. That feeling he, he was a. Uh, he was kind of a sort of abandoned by his father when he was real young. I know a lot of people have experienced that, you know, the family breaks up and one of the family members goes away and, you know, and so he had that, those abandonment feelings. I, I'm, I remember reading, he called himself, um, what was that? The, uh, unaccompanied minor because he was always, you know, he was flown to his dad's and flown back and, you know, it was always unaccompanied. So they put a little sign on him when he boarded the plane. So people knew he didn't have a parent with him. And uh, so he felt alone when he was traveling and all that stuff. And that was that's kind of the um, uh, how he sort of developed his humor. And in, in the fact that that was just kind of a way to cope with those that loneliness and the abandonment issues. And I remember I was kind of that way. I didn't really my family didn't break up, but but uh, they were, I was kind of free to do whatever I wanted when I was a kid. In fact, by the t- by my early teens, I had my own entrance to my house so I could sneak out all the time and things like that. And so I didn't really it wasn't so much an abandonment issue, but it was not the it wasn't the cohesive family unit where we do everything together so i would go out and get in trouble and things like that uh, but uh a lot of this uh, the the book you know it 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 shows a lot of the things that he went through and i guess that's to bring home the point of how bad addiction can get and it's definitely you know it doesn't matter how much money you have he said he was making a million dollars a week and he spent over seven million trying to get sober with therapists and rehabs and all that stuff. He'd been to rehab multiple times, and uh, he still wasn't able to maintain his sobriety. and And it's tough. Mm. And I've heard, uh, I've in fact, the uh, person that ran the the rehab that Marcus and I went to, he went to rehab thirteen times. You don't have to go to rehab a whole bunch of times. Sometimes it's a necessary thing. Both Marcus and I went to rehab once and we were able yeah. to get sober and there were challenges for both of us afterwards absolutely but uh, it can be done absolutely and i think too one of the things that i noticed about this book that that stood out to me was when matthew perry was talking about his upbringing his life the way he felt and it was as if there was a reason or excuse for the drinking And one of the things that has kept me sober eight and a half years was separating, right? I remember in one part, we'll get to uh, one page, he was talking about uh, going to a trauma center and he was going to go and and deal with all his trauma and then he'd come out and maybe he'd be sober and be able to, to live this way. And I know a lot of people think this way. And this is one of the things where, you know, you can have all the knowledge in the world, you could deal with all the stuff in the world and you still don't get it. Like he went to trauma therapy. He went to more rehabs than I can count, um, all kinds of stuff. And at the end of the book, he's still lonely as heck. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so what is it? Because for me, I look at it and I'm like, okay, I dealt with loneliness. I dealt with this stuff, but somehow sobriety gave me this gift of being able to, to deal with myself and stand to be alone with myself and, and understand that I'm okay and to enjoy my own company. And one of the things that 
was glaringly obvious throughout this book, which was a problem I really, really, really struggled with. Um, and that is the problem of racing thoughts. Oh, yeah. And before I got sober, my thoughts went a mile a minute. I thought I had to drink or use to shut them off. It was like, okay, I, I can't do it. And, and this is the issue where in Western culture, we think we are a victim of our brain or we're controlled by our brain and our thoughts. This is the flaw. And I don't know how this came to me, but somewhere in sobriety, I learned, hey, you're not your mind. You're not your thoughts. Like, I can think about elephants all day. I don't become an elephant. I can think about drinking every day. I didn't become a booze, you know, or a, a drink. And we start to think about that. We're like, wait a minute. Have I been living my entire life as if my mind and my thoughts control everything? And you look at it. You got the law of attraction. Your thoughts are things. You got the Bible that says there's a wrestling war between your thoughts and good and evil. And it's like, wait a minute. Is that true? Is that actually true and helpful in my life? No, right. it's not. Because the average person has about 60,000 thoughts a day. You're just choosing which ones to dwell on. It's all there is. And guess what? Your thoughts are probably like my thoughts. Matthew Perry's thoughts, he's sitting there with, you know, 150 million in the bank. Throughout the book, he's worried about money. Oh, I'm only getting this much for that show. Oh, this guy over here, you know, wanted to start a rehab and I lost 500 grand. Wait a minute. You would think... Hey, you got 150 million in the bank. That's enough for my entire lineage to live comfortably until inflation gets way out of hand, which probably will never come to that point. But you would think that that would go away. But the fact of the matter is it isn't. Everything he had before he was famous went into his life throughout. And from what I understood with the book, with his book, was... There was no real resolve to that. There was no real, hey, this is what I did. This is how I live differently now. And that, that was something that was worrisome to me. And this, this one on page 25, he says, um, at least I had the decency to turn into an alcoholic and an addict and not blame other people. That was a little difficult to, to stomach in this book because in my opinion, most of the book was blaming other people for the addiction. And I think that's difficult because here's the deal, guys. When you deal with addiction, there's the addict and there's the addiction. There's the substance and then there's a substance user. When you have chemical dependency, all bets are off. There was a point in my life, in Terry's life, in Matthew Perry's life, where the drug took over. Now, it doesn't matter a flying anything what made the drug start coming up in your life, right? He talks about when he first drank and, oh, the euphoric feeling, and it was wonderful. I got that. Terry's got it. Go to an AA meeting. Everyone's got that. But when it takes over is when chemical dependency kicks in. And you might read the book and go, oh, my gosh, he was taking 55 of these things a day. 55 a day. Well... I know lots of people who do that. Is it safe? No. Is it completely off the charts? Yeah. Does it make sense mentally? No. Why does it happen? Because he's a degenerate, because he's got too much money, because is No. Because an addict is chemically dependent, and all they want is more of the chemical. But once yep. you take the chemical off the table, things start to change. And I think that's an important key that for me, I found lacking. What do you think about that, Terry? Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's that's one thing that isn't touched upon as much as it should be in the book. And and that was the case with me. I just wanted more. Mm -hmm. And and I, I've said that many times in meetings and things like that is, is my addiction is to more. I want more. doesn't matter what it is. It could be pizza. I want more pizza. I order an extra, extra large pizza. I'm I very likely will eat the whole thing, even though two pieces is enough. And uh, that's that's just um, a thing in my brain. But now that I'm sober, I have control of that. And I and I and for something like pizza, 
I can stop it too. I don't want to, but I can. Something like alcohol, I understand that that, that obsession is going to kick in if I have that one drink and I'm not going to know when to stop. I'm going to keep going. I've proved it to myself over and over again. And I have to remember that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, but um, there was, where'd my mouse go? I was trying to scroll back up. Because uh, Ben had said, uh, I wanted to get to a couple of comments real quick because they were pretty good. Ben said, I recently learned that your self-worth is determined by yourself. Even if you had a rough upbringing, it's very powerful to know that. And I agree with you. It's my self-worth is definitely, it's determined by me. Yeah. Other people will have their opinions. Absolutely. I have to let that go. I absolutely have to let that go. And Dave also said, he said, I didn't get sober until I finally made the decision that I had to stop drinking when I decided to do it for me and not because of my wife and kids wanted me to. I got sober. And Dave, that was the case with me as well. Other people wanted me to stop my I, I lost jobs, lost a marriage, all this other stuff. Nothing was going to make me stop until I wanted to stop. That's a that's a big factor right there. Yeah. Those are Two important things. And Danny, you're three days sober. Congratulations on that. Keep it up, brother. Absolutely. And I think uh, something interesting, too, about self-worth, and we talk about it on this channel all the time, and it, it goes for Matthew Perry's uh, addictions and, and things like that as well. And that is that if I was you and I was raised like you and I went through what you went through, I would be you and I'd make the decisions you make. Right? I think that, that all of us are born in with kind of like a blank slate okay we got our dna and we got our upbringing and everything like that but our situations mold who we are our situations kind of make us do what we're gonna do it's kind of like a programming now once during our life we 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 wake up to this for me it took sobriety to wake me up to it and say wait a minute you've been living on autopilot rather than looking at things and saying hey I don't have to do this. And even now, even now that I live differently and think differently, I still see those things go in my life. Like for me, I was always kind of like a people pleaser. And I think Matthew Perry was the same way. And, um, you know, I see that in my new way of thinking. I'm like, oh, hey, the world is all one and we should all be together and be happy. Well, that's basically people pleasing. It's just the, the sober Marcus version. And, you know, I like that one. Um, but it's interesting because Matthew Perry, uh, on page 32, he says, this is the answer I thought after he had taken his first drink. Uh, this is what I've been missing. This is, this must be how normal people feel all the time. I don't have any problems. It's all gone. I don't need attention. I'm taken care of and I'm fine. And he felt this warm feeling using and drinking. And I think a lot of us addicts and alcoholics feel that because of the fact that we believe all of our problems are actually what they are, right? We believe that they're these big things when in actuality, right now, most of us are okay. Like if, if Matthew Perry sat down, didn't do his drugs for a minute when he was in the middle of his addiction and said, okay, I got a house paid for, don't have to work the rest of my life. I go out on the street and people like me so much I can't even go out on the street, okay, which might be a problem in and of itself. But if he sat there and said, you know what, right now everything's okay and everything's taken care of and I'm going to be okay just being by myself and being me. That, I think, is the key, is learning to be okay in your own skin. And I think that's something that alcoholics and addicts talk about all the time is, I'm not comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. And I wasn't. I hated myself. Thought I was the biggest crackpot in the world. Thought I was a piece of junk. That nobody would ever love me. Still sometimes think that way. But now I realize it's the programming. It's not truth. And when you realize truth. that I have just as much value as Terry. Terry has as much value as... Matthew Perry and, and the people listening. And we start to understand, wait, we have an inerrant value because we're here. And I will say something because this book to me alluded of privilege and I'm special and look at me go. When one of the biggest things, the thing that keeps me sober today is knowing that no one cares and I'm just as special as 8 billion other people on the planet. 
And when you start to look at life differently and you're like, okay, so that guy is on a light bulb box that sits in my house and everyone thinks that that's a cool thing. Okay, some people might say, well, that's kind of an insane way to look at it. Is there another way? Is it not a light bulb box that we all look at and say, oh, that guy's popular because he's on the box? Um, and we start to realize that that only matters in the confines of our society. But either way, we're all the same, right? Addiction yeah. got him health-wise just like it gets many other people. I sat next to a guy in rehab uh, eight and a half years ago, had the same exact thing, showed me his scars, everything. Now, he was, I think, pushing 70, but he'd been through the ringer. And we start to realize that it's a freeing thing to understand that I'm not special. I used Absolutely. to think it was terrifying. But, Terry, go ahead. Let's hear your take on that. Oh, I agree completely. That's what that, it, that is true freedom is realizing that I'm not special. And also that people people think about me a lot less than I think they do, yeah. if you know what I mean. But, uh, you know, back to his comment that, that he made that, you know, that he had that first drink and he thought that this is this is must be what normal people feel like. Um, that's just an illusion. And I've heard so many people, so many stories of alcoholics that have gotten sober and, and they experience the same thing. I don't know that I had that feeling when I took my first drink, but I've heard many people say that, that they took that drink and that that was the answer. It made them feel normal. And I don't think normal people feel normal. I don't think there is a normal. You know what I, if, I'm not sure if I'm explaining that quite right, but, but I think um, somebody who is not an alcoholic, they have their problems. They have their uneasy times. I've been sober for years now, and, and I've, I have uneasy times. I have big fears all the time, definitely. It happens. But now I know how to deal with them, where before the answer was alcohol. And that gave me a few minutes towards the end, a few seconds of relief. And, yeah. But really, all that did was push those fears further down the road to only come back stronger. It's, it was it was a difficult thing to get through. Absolutely. But, um, yeah. And uh, page 38, he says, it was like the bad parts of my life were appearing to me all at once. And mm -hmm. I think this is interesting because, you know, this is where things start to change. When you stop looking at life as something that's happening to you, all the bad parts of my life are appearing to me all at once. Okay. I, I felt that way. I remember uh, my grandpa passed. I had to close down uh, my office. All this stuff was going on at once. My marriage was in shambles. My life was in shambles. Finance. I was going through the ringer. And now I'm in a mental hospital. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what, what happened? Why did all this stuff happen to me? Well, one, it happens to everyone. Matthew Perry was in a mental hospital. Lots of people were. Lots of people went to rehab. Lots of people. You're not that special. Once we've realized that, it's like, wait a minute. I'm just another person. That's it. I know that modern culture wants to teach us all that we're special, but, you know, just like Terry, I'm no more special. He's no more special. Matthew Perry's no more special. Just happens to be, you know, a lot of people know who he is. And we start to realize that, one, yeah, it's not just happening to me. It's happening to everyone. Just as you think the worst thing is happening in your life, someone... Somewhere on earth is having something way worse. Probably a thousand people at that exact moment. And you realize that, wait a minute. Oh, I'm going through this divorce. Well, actually, you know, I think it's seven out of ten marriages end in divorce. So get in line. Oh, I got this health problem. Lots of people do too. It's, it's not partial. And when we realize that life is what life is and we accept it as it is, then we can live a new way. And two... One thing, when you think the bad parts of your life are appearing all at once, like Matthew Perry did, we need to realize that 99% of our problems are of our own making. It's of your own making. It's either perspective yeah. or something you created. Yes, I understand that all too well. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. uh, 
Yeah, you know, towards the in in the end of the book, he does talk about gratitude and how thankful he is that he was able to get sober, mm-hmm. and was able to get through the the demons that he has. And he he did he has mentioned in the interviews that he wanted to wait until he felt that his sobriety was strong enough to write this book, and um, so that's that's where he's at. Uh, f- for me, um, I think just just uh, sharing the message of sobriety and sharing what I do in sobriety is is important to me, and it's important for my sobriety. It reminds me of these things. These talks bring up um, some of the things that I shouldn't do as well. And that's that's important, too. But, um, you know, talking about the gratitude, he, he is very thankful. And that's I think that's a huge part of sobriety. Mm-hmm. We tend to focus on the negative. And I think throughout that book, he does talk about the negative things in his life and his negative focuses. And, you know, he'd go to a rehab and and, you know, hate the people at rehab because they wouldn't let him. They wouldn't give him the drugs because he was going through detox or whatever it was. And he'd look at their their faults rather than what they were helping with. And it's it's a really I'm not saying this is easy. This is a really difficult thing to do, especially when you're going through detox. It's it's the worst feeling in the world, and it's really hard to look at the positive. Mm-hmm. But uh, but what what I had to do is I had to get through it. And after that, then I had to really start to grasp onto that acceptance that Marcus was talking about, accepting that I'm just one of you know, 8 billion people and that other people have worse problems than me and my problems really aren't that bad. I have them and that doesn't minimize my problems, but, but that it, it gives me a little bit of, of, of calm feelings that realizing that other people are doing this too and they've gotten through it so I can get through it too. And now that, that's, that was big for me as long as I stay sober. Yeah. You know, and um, who was it that had three days? Danny had three days. And, you know, it's tough. You got you got a medical condition and you can do this. I've, I've known people that have that have had similar medical conditions as you and they've gotten through it. They've been able to stay sober. And in fact, a good friend of mine, he's 35 years sober with similar conditions as you have. And uh, it, it can be done. We can do this. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting, too, because. You know, a lot of people, there's a lot of critics about this book, and there's a lot of people hating on the book, and there are some things I don't like in the book. There are some things that are red flags in sobriety for me, but I will tell you this one thing. When I say, if I grew up like you and took life and dealt with things the way you did, I would be you and I'd make your decisions. Same thing happens. If I was 25 years old and I started making a million dollars a week and I was on a show and life exploded the way it did for him, yeah, I would have I would have taken a bunch of stuff. I would have drank a bunch. I probably would have been more reckless. Like, you know, you look at it, and it's easy to judge someone who has all this stuff going on. Oh, well, you know, if I had all that money, I wouldn't be this way. Yeah, but if you were in his shoes, you would be that way. If you had that upbringing and that lockstep way of thinking of, Nobody loves me. I'm not good enough. Making a million dollars a week. Got the best girlfriend in Hollywood. I'm not good enough. Not good enough. Yeah, you would have felt that too. You would have had the exact same thing. I've had lots of those thoughts. And so you realize that, wait a minute. I need to understand not just that I'm one of eight billion and that I was programmed to be the way I was. And that addiction took over, but other people are that way too. And other people have struggles and hurts and hates. That's not to say let yourself get walked on by people who are clearly not kind. Obviously take care of yourself. But that is to say that there is a way of understanding. And when you can understand that in others, I think you can understand that and forgive and understand yourself. And say, wait a minute. So I was literally under a spell of my current thinking and also alcoholism. And for that, I'm responsible for the things I chose to do. I'm responsible for the the stuff I chose to take. But I was also under a spell. Right? Much like when you see people in uh, other countries and the food supply runs out. And within weeks, days... They're like, 
animals fighting each other tooth and nail to get stuff out of a dumpster. Three weeks ago, they were probably eating caviar. Now they're in a dumpster. Now they're acting like crazy people that they would never have imagined before. Three days off food? Yeah, I'm so special that three days off food will make me a completely different person. You look at people who are in concentration camps. Completely different people when they come out. Why? Circumstance. People who go to prison. Different people than when they come out. Why? Circumstance. Your environment and your circumstances change your personality and who you are. This is why recovery and, and your plan of sobriety has to be number one. Because if it's not, some circumstance, some change in your life will take over and you won't even recognize yourself in 90 days. Hey, that's why they say, oh, you know, I've been sober a week. Okay, that's good. That's amazing. That is a great feat. But call me when you've been sober a year. Because things in life start to change, and that is where the magic starts to happen. Now, that's not to minimize it. One day sober, get a trophy. Line up, right? They don't give you a little coin. They should give you a trophy, right? Yeah. Knowing me, I would have taken the trophy and filled it with booze and said, yay, there we go. Stand like (laughs) that. That's why they just gave you a coin. (laughs) That's exactly why. Yeah, if they gave me a a half dollar, I'd be like, okay, one more, and I could get a, a beer at the happy hour. But we start to understand that It's a big feat, but you haven't changed yet. I probably still haven't changed. Changed a little bit. Still a work in progress. But you start to understand that these things affect you. That's why relapse, like three days of relapse, you'll be a different person. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think what you have, maybe you haven't noticed a lot of change. I'm sure you have changed, and I'm sure I've changed. But the one important thing is, is that we've, We're open to change now. Before, I was in a rut. I wanted the drink. That was my priority. Nothing was changing other than the fact I was changing for the worse. I was getting sicker and sicker. But nothing in my life was changing to the better. And and now I'm open to it. And that was, that's, it's it's a great feeling. And that allows me to grow. And that's what I try to do is just continue to grow however, however little it is however little I get done. Mm-hmm. But that's that's what I try to do on a daily basis. Absolutely. And ben, ben had said, if I could go back to my teenage self and look at myself in the future, I know I'd be saying, why am I acting like that? Why am I drinking so much? Well, I think if I was to do that myself, Ben, um, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back with the mind I have now, now to do that. I don't think I was equipped when I was younger to recognize any of this stuff. I didn't recognize any of this stuff and for decades. Yeah. I didn't realize that this was that the way I was acting may cause problems. And actually, now looking back on it, I'm thankful for what I've been through. Am I thankful that I became an alcoholic? Well, I don't know. That's that's debatable. But I've learned how to live life now. Where before I didn't really know how to live life. I I knew this quick answer and it wasn't the answer in the long run. Absolutely. And I think it's, I think what it comes down to and what really worried me about this book is the number one thing that made me drink was ego. Yeah. That's what it was. It was ego. I deserve, I should have, my life should be, this shouldn't feel this way. I don't want to feel, I don't want to think, I can't be alone with me. I, 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 I. And it's like this on page 129. I did the right thing and waited for the cops to arrive. I kept glancing at the sky, wondering when the next cartoon anvil was going to fall on my head. I was there long enough for someone to take a picture and sell it to People magazine. My car in a house, me on the way to staying with my father in Ojai. And we look at this and we're like, okay, here's this guy who's at the pinnacle of his career. He's going to stay with his dad because he can't stay sober. And he feels like everything wrong is happening to him. Where is the anvil where is the, the, the road runner? Where is the, the wily coyote with the rock? And when's it going to fall on my head? Because everything bad happens to me. Well, does it? Does everything bad happen to you? You were on the top sitcom. You got more money than you know what to do with. You got nice houses. You got nice stuff. 
you can have like your career will ne never be over because you just go and be like, yeah, I was on this. Let's do a reboot. Apparently there's nothing new to, to write about. So they reboot everything. And we look at that and we're like, here's this guy who seemingly has everything saying, when's, when's the last straw going to happen? Why does everything bad happen to me? Now, I will tell you, guilty as charged. I lived in a beautiful house in Northern California. Kids, beautiful, wonderful, smart kids. Everything was going right. I had a business. I didn't even have to work. Like one year, I didn't, I didn't even have to do anything. All I did was check how much money I made. And it was thousands of dollars a day. And I was like, what the hell? And we look at it. And why was I thinking everything bad happens to me? When you might look in and be like, well, I don't know what you're drinking or taking, but that looks pretty good to me. And we start to understand this is a condition of the way we've been trained to think and years of warped thinking by alcohol. This is why I believe, I'm not a doctor, physician, or anything like that, but this is why I believe rehab works. It works because I couldn't come to the conclusion because I was fogged by alcohol. I needed someone to physically take me and say, you are away from alcohol. Let your brain get somewhat normal, normal as an addict who had drank for years and had a clouded mind. I remember my grandma drank for years. And one day she, she told everyone that she believed she was the daughter of an Indian prince and she was the princess. And we're like, yeah, uh, Grandma, you know, um, we, don't, we don't come from that line. Yeah, that, that's made up. You come from Alabama. I, 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 you know, I mean, we know the people that came from England. That's where they came from. I, I'm sorry, Grandma, you're mistaken, but she believed it because of years of drinking. And we start to believe our own lies. And the minute we get better, a lot of people say our secrets keep us stuck, this, that, that. The minute we get better is when we realize that the bullshit we tell ourselves is bullshit that doesn't matter. I don't need to compare my bullshit with your bullshit. I don't need to act like things matter when they don't. I don't need to take every thought as if it's gospel truth because it's not. <laughs> I'm not in a fight trying to slow my mind down. All I need to do is say, thanks for sharing. And this is the one thing that I think was so profound that I inadvertently learned in AA meetings. Because I come from a place which might be like how uh, Matthew Perry was, where, you know, I would tell my story to people and they would get sad and they'd pat me on the back and hug me and say, oh, that's so sad. And then I went to AA and I poured my heart out and they said, thanks for sharing, next. I was like, wait, wait a minute. What the hell is wrong with you heartless people? Where's my coddling? What, you don't want to go sit on someone's lap and get a, a candy bar? You know, what, what's going on here? Why does no one care? And then, bing, it went off like a light bulb in my head. And I said, wait a minute. It doesn't matter as much as I thought it did. Right. And that was like, I was like, wow, that's pretty, where is that in the big book? I didn't see that anywhere. But inadvertently, you learn that because I, my story is just important as everyone else's. It's only me who thinks it's more important. It's only Matthew Perry who thinks his is more important. And you think it's more important by reading it. And it's this big game of life that says, oh, this is important. This is not important. I go to the front of the class I go to the back of the class. This is what I get. This is what I have. This is what this person's worth. This is that. And it keeps us insane and drunk. And the reason I drank is because I wanted to be at the pinnacle of it. I bought it so bad. I was like, okay, I need to be this because success equals this in my life. That's what it equals. And then I realized, no, it doesn't. There are people that are school teachers who love their job, who make 25 grand a year and are on government assistance that are way happier than I will ever be. But life tells us that Matthew Perry with $200 million should be more happy. Why is it not working? And I think that's what he does. That's what he does allude to towards the, towards the end that he still has that hole mm -hmm. that he's trying to fill. And that's a dangerous thing. 
I, I relate to the, the hole in my heart that I had that something was missing in my life. Mm -hmm. And alcohol filled it for a time, and then it didn't. But I thought drinking more alcohol would fill it, and it didn't. Yep. I had to get sober. I had to learn how to live life. I had to learn how to fill that hole in my heart and learn how to live life with a purpose yep. and get some friends. And, and stop. Go ahead. It's interesting, too, because this is a topic that me and the hole in the heart go way back. Uh, you know, way back in my 43 years of life, way, way back to the dinosaurs. Um, but uh, I used to be a preacher, and there was these group of people who would preach the gospel the way of, oh, you have, you know, this vacuum in your heart, only God can fill. And then I got to AA, and I heard something similar, and I'm like, yeah, put your Bible away. I don't want that. I, I had been abused in churches. I dealt with all kinds of crap in churches. Didn't want anything to do with churches again. Right, because it just didn't work. And I realized that this hole I had been trying to fill didn't really exist. You know what it is? I actually learned it as a marketer many years later. It's consumerism telling you that the next thing, the next person, the next feeling, the next thing will make you happy. And that's pretty much addiction. You just don't have chemical dependency unless you choose a chemical to be your next thing, which is what Terry and I did and Matthew Perry did. It is addicting in and of itself, but it's not chemical dependency. And when I realized that, wait a minute, I feel this void because I just feel a void. And when I stopped trying to fill the void, it went away. When I realized that life is what life is. And I don't know. I don't know what God thinks about. I used to think I did. I had a book and I said, oh, I'll tell you a page, chapter. This is what he thinks. This is what Terry should do. This is what this guy, and I had everything figured out. And then I realized I'm one of 8 billion people. I ain't got shit figured out. The money in the bank don't matter. Nothing matters. What matters is I'm here. And I'm glad to be here for the first time in my life. Glad to be here. I'm yeah. okay. I could go sit on the grass and be okay. And I can be grateful. And I need nothing. And I lack nothing. Why? Because I'm not looking for other things to make me happy. I'm right. looking for contentment in this moment, which exists for all of us. The, f the funny thing about alcoholism that I learned and addiction is that the feelings that Matthew Perry talks about, like, my blood turns into honey, and I feel warm and great. That was your body's reaction to a drug. That's what it was. That yeah. reaction is in your body anyway. Right? Yep. Like, 9% 9 or 99% of a lot of the things that mess with my life can be solved with exercise or a different way of eating or meditation or relaxation, or getting my thoughts off of myself. Maybe I'll go help someone else. That'll help me. Might be a little narcissistic thinking I can help other people, but hey, it seems to work somehow, right? And we start to realize that, and we start to realize that that void in our life, it just magically goes away. And I don't, was it like that for you, Terry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, doing what people suggested... For me to do in sobriety, that's definitely helped. But really, it was it came down to um, not drinking. It was that simple. Um, you know, you're talking about that feeling that he that uh, Matthew was talking about. Um, you know, that my blood turned to honey. You know, that feeling that's the endorphins going through and making him feel good. And I experienced that in sobriety all the time. And, you know, like uh, one, one, one of the places I experienced this, and I didn't think this would happen, uh, is at a concert of somebody that I really like. Go to a really great concert. And they're playing, they're playing and playing. And I get that feeling when I'm, you know, standing there and really enjoying the music. I can get that feeling, that blood turning to honey, that feel-good feeling. Or hiking in, in the hills and just seeing the beautiful view of the sunset that's approaching mm -hmm. 
You know, that's it's pretty cool. And that happens for me all the time in sobriety. Um, it does happen if I do, uh, if I am helping somebody and, you know, if they, they really appreciate it, that that can happen then too. And, but that, that hole in the heart, it's, it has disappeared for the most part. But, uh, you know, I still have some of those lonely feelings as well. That can happen. But I think that's, that's part of life. You know, we, it's not all, it's not all good. Yeah. Life is life. And I've learned how to live with it and it's okay. Life's all right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, uh, for me, finding sobriety made my view of what I thought God was change because I used to know this is what God is. This is what he thinks. And when that changed, I realized that, Hey, wait a minute, my thoughts and everything, they're not that important. And I realized that I could just be okay. And yeah. life is just what it is. There's a part on page 182 um, of Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing, uh, Matthew Perry book, where he says, I was under the impression that during this stay in rehab and a trauma thing, I was going to have to do deep trauma work, reaching back into my childhood and pulling out all the pain and loneliness, thereby beginning the very painful process of letting these things go. The idea was that if I got over these traumatic events, I would no longer feel the need to cover them up with drugs and alcohol. Well, I think I could be wrong, but uh, I think that modern psychology focuses so much, Western psychology focuses so much on Dr. Freud's work. Oh, the problems with your upbringing, the problems with this, and uh, the sexual problems, and all this stuff. Rather than focusing on what we really want, which is to feel okay. So how does someone with all this pain and all this trauma and childhood stuff feel okay? Well, I had a mild version of childhood trauma from what I read in the book, unless there's any other zingers he left out. I would say maybe similar. Maybe I, I mean, I had some abuse in mine. Didn't read that in his. Um, you know, uh, I had physical, emotional, and uh, other types of abuse in mine. Um, what helped me? Well, when I drank, I tried to work through it. I went to all these therapies and stuff. And therapy is good. It can help. For me, it was realizing and accepting what is happens everywhere. Why did my parents do this to me? No, no, no. Why do people that probably should be having kids at that time have kids at that time and treat them this way with the knowledge they have? It happens everywhere. That's why, they, why am I an alcoholic? Gosh, darn it, everyone could, no, everyone can't drink. That's why there's a freaking AA every 10 steps. 12 steps. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why did this happen to me? There's trauma support groups everywhere. Everyone feels the same way. Does that make it okay? Should you go and, you know, uh, be friends with the people? No. There's someone in my life I said, no, not going to do it. Painful. Can't see other people because of it. But I'm like, no, there was abuse. It was not acknowledged. I'm not going to be in the presence of that person anymore. It's not going to happen. Okay, that's my preservation. Do I hang on to harbor, have these ill? No, whatever. They do what they do. That's their bag. And I realized their bag had nothing to do with me. Just like when you're on the road and you're driving and someone cuts you off. Oh, damn it. Doesn't that person know I'm here? They don't care. They don't know anything about you in your car. You could pull them over five seconds away and say, what was the color of the car and who was in it? Be like, I don't know. I'm just going down the freeway. They drive like an ass. It has nothing to do with you. People are harmful and hurtful. It has nothing to do with you. And when we realize that life doesn't happen to me, it's happening everywhere to everyone, Good, bad, rich, poor. Stuff happens to everyone. Right? We look at it, we're like, rich guy gets sick. Rich guy gets abused. Poor guy gets sick. Poor guy gets abused. It's everywhere. It's the luck of the draw. It is what it is. It, the world spins whether I'm on it or not. Whether I'm happy or not. And we start to realize that that could be depressing 
or freeing. Because now I'm free to live and just be. I don't have to live up to some standards. I don't have to feel a certain way to be okay. Uh, what do you think about all that, Terry? <laughs> well, you just unpacked a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it, for for me, um, yeah, I've, I've had to learn to ex- accept things the way they are. And I think that's what... Uh, that's what Matthew Perry is trying to do as well in his book is just trying to accept things for what it was, accept what had happened. He's got it. He, he went through a tough road mm-hmm. and many of the people that, uh, that I've been in contact with have as well. And I, I don't know. I, I, I look at my, uh, my journey and yeah, I had difficult times, but a lot of people have had worse. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough for anybody, whether they're rich or poor to get sober but we can all do it and um we both marcus and i have done it we've been successful at our sobriety so far and uh matthew perry is trying to trying to stay sober himself same thing he's got the same struggles that we do and um you know that's that's what we have to try to do on a daily basis yeah uh there's an interesting thing on pay i didn't think take the page number but it's a first uh, part of chapter 10 where he says uh, this is perhaps something that a normie someone who can drink and is not an alcoholic what we alcoholics call you lucky non-alcoholics I think this was interesting choice of words because um, on this channel we talk a lot about the guy in the back of the AA room who's angry that he can't drink and this kind of spoke that to me Lucky non-alcoholics. I wish I was like them so that I could drink. Um, I, I no longer wish I could drink. That's something that was taken away from me. I don't know how. I don't know why. It just was. And I no longer care. And I, I think that's freeing because it doesn't matter anymore. I don't want to drink. I don't feel like drinking. I don't envy those that can drink. I'm not bummed out that I can't drink. I just don't want to. I think for me... For me it- it's even one more step than that. I absolutely don't want to drink and it's freeing that I don't want to drink because now I can do things like go to the supermarket at 10 PM. You know, I don't have to worry about having drinks and then driving home. You know, there's, there's so much freedom in not drinking. It's awesome. Yeah. And, um, I wanted to say, uh, congratulations, Tony. Um, and Hey, uh, you love AA, you go in person and on zoom and, and you need all the help you can get. That's what I've done as well. Especially in the beginning, I did everything I possibly could to stay sober. I went to meetings. There's also for some of, for all of us, there's at our hospitals, there's usually a recovery group there at churches. There's groups. There's all sorts of different ways to get sober. We have a program as well that you guys can uh, that you guys can sign up for at, at talksober.com. But try everything. That's what I did, and yeah. so start to settle in on what might work for you. And for me, um, I've had to change the things I do through sobriety. Sobriety is not a destination; it's a journey. So you have to try to learn to adapt to what's what's going on in your life. What do I need right now? You have to try to learn to recognize what the issues are and learn how to deal with them. And that's what I've tried to do. And so far, it's worked. But as you you guys have all heard me say, I'm always saying so far because I understand that it's still in me. And I do have to continue to take action in the right direction to stay sober. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting, too, because, you know, we talk about all this stuff and we look at this book and we understand the mind of an addict and you know for Matthew Perry to open up about this great for me at the end I was left without resolve I was like so so what happened and it kind of seemed like it just left hanging okay um yeah I'm a little grateful for things now and that's it still has feelings of loneliness still has feelings of all that other stuff and as did I When I first got sober, I didn't know which way was up. Um, But I think the key is that if you're still drinking and you're still using, stop life for a moment. Pause. And by life, I mean the external things that you think are important. Stop thinking about that for a moment. 
Because for me, I, I can't go to rehab. I got a business to run. I can't do this. I'm a father. I can't do this. I cook for my family. Who's going to eat? It'll be okay. Right now, you need to focus on getting safe. Go to a detox. Go to a doctor. Detox is, as you learn from this book, it is not fun. And it can be life-threatening. So that's number one. And number two is focus on what you're going to do to not drink. That's one thing that I didn't see here. It was kind of open to just going to take life as it keeps coming at me. One of the things I needed to resolve is I'm not going to drink again the rest of my life as long as I can help it. And I'm going to start with today. And if you do that, if alcohol and whatever you use is off the table, not going to touch it, not, no way, no how. Even if my butt falls off, I am not going to use or drink today. What's going to happen is you are going to bring your body and your mind is going to follow. And you're going to have to learn to live with life sober. Some of it is going to be difficult as freaking hell. Some of it is you're just going to be brought to the brink of, I need to go and I need to go use and drink. But I'm not going to because I made that resolve. And that is most important. Because I can get through any feeling. Went to rehab. I went to the mental hospital. I went through. Okay. I can get through a lot of stuff. And over the years of sobriety, I dealt with a lot of stuff. My dad passing, other people. All kinds of stuff. That I would have never thought I could get through sober. But I did. How? By staying sober. That is the utmost important thing for me. I don't care what everyone else does. I don't care what. I am not going to drink. And I. Went to AA to do it. I went to all, I, I had to learn what am I going to do today to not drink? Not how am I going to feel better today? It's not a, it does, whatever. It's neither here nor there. I feel like crap today because I did not sleep last night. I feel terrible, but that doesn't matter. I'm not going to go drink. I'm going to do what I need to do to stay sober. Me too. Yeah. Um, and today... Today, I'm not going to drink. Absolutely. And I think that's the key is understanding that's where the healing comes. Because if you're an addict or an alcoholic, chemical dependency kicks in and it screws with your mind. But if the chemical's gone, that part is gone. It's magic. Once the chemical's gone, chemical cravings are... Well, Marcus, I had cravings two years later. Yeah, they're mental. The physical yep. stuff is gone after about a week or two. Okay, detox, week or two, you're good. For alcohol. Other stuff, I don't know. Um, but we start to understand it, and we start to say, wait a minute. So the chemical, you look at Matthew Perry. All right, he had a tough upbringing, felt these ways, all this stuff. Okay? Then he poured alcohol and pills on it. And they said, wow, everything's really screwed up. Well, you were okay, okay 30 years ago. But now all of a sudden, after all this drinking and all this using, it is unbearable and intolerable and you can't live with yourself and all this stuff. Maybe, just maybe, that's the chemical talking and not you. Hopefully, you liked our take on the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I, I think it's good to bring awareness. Was a little bit of a drunk -a -log. Um I think you, that... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if, you, if, if I could take one thing from this book. Yeah, I mean, yes, there was a drunk -a -log and and all that, but... Uh, one thing that that does show that this book shows is no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad you are, you can find sobriety. And um, he's just he's a rich guy, but uh, he's able to find sobriety. I know people that are that have been through uh, situations very much like his, possibly even worse with all the rehabs and fighting this disease for so long. And have managed to get sober and have very long-lasting sobriety. It can be done. 
And that's one thing that this book really does show. Absolutely. Um, and he was my favorite character on Friends. Oh, like, yeah. I thought, it, I thought it was good. Um, but, you know, I think that's the key is to realize that the mindset stuff is so key. Understanding that life doesn't happen to you. It, it, it happens, and you just happen to be here. That's, what, that's what, how it works. And realizing that I'm not that important. Even if I have a high-profile job and I think I'm important, like I used to think, you know, I was so important. And then I realized after I was in rehab 30 days and nobody, literally nobody, except for my wife and kids, gave a rip. I was like, hey, this is kind of freeing. Nobody really cares. Yeah. And it is freeing. And that's what we talk about in our TalkSober.com uh, course is the mindset shift that happened. And it didn't happen right away. It took years and years to develop the way of thinking and a new life philosophy. Instead of life's happening to me, when's the anvil going to drop? Oh my gosh, everything's terrible. It was, hey, wait a minute. Everything's kind of wonderful. Like literally, you put this little thing in the dirt and a tree grows up and gives you fruit. Now, I know that all the things in the world are saying, oh, food shortage, food shortage. But food makes more food. Like, the problems in our society aren't because there's a not enough stuff. Nature produces enough stuff. It's us ruining it. That's the problem. And we start to realize that, wait a minute. I've been going against the grain all my life. And all I need to do is float downstream and enjoy all the stuff that's here anyway? You feel lonely? There's 7.999999 billion other people. And you're lonely. Go meet someone. I mean, it's all there and it's all clear. And once we understand and get out of our pity party and our central us thinking, everything starts to change. And I realize, oh, I'm an alcoholic, I'm lonely. Hey, Terry's just like me. He went through this. He hid alcohol in the same place as I did. He went through the same stuff I did. Like I, I remember in rehab, I was like, I'm not going to be friends with that Terry guy. I mean, he's a weirdo. He's probably thinking the same thing about me. He's like, who's this guy think he is? Right? And now we're good friends because it's like, hey, we're the same. And yeah. we start to see that the world is a beautiful place if you look in the right spots. That's right. And it's, it's what happens between the words. It's what happens between racing to and from, trying to get the life you want. It's been there all along. That thing that you need to fill the void, it's been there all along. Like, it's there. And all I got to do is say, I'm going to stay sober because I don't need to drink anymore because things are good. It's going to be okay. Any last yes. minute thoughts? <laughs> oh, you're good. <laughs> All right. Thank guys. you. Thank you everybody for joining us. And we, we really appreciate your comments. Awesome. And uh, yeah, stay I sober. Guess.